Emily. Oh, Kevin. While playing with my nephew in the park, I unexpectedly ran into my former boss, who had abruptly left the company three years ago. After taking two weeks of paid leave, she disappeared without giving any reason. Now, standing beside my former boss, was a girl who looked about kindergarten age. Back then, I thought she had left to live a happy married life. I'm Kevin, 27 years old. After graduating from college, I joined a small and medium-sized business. I felt I could manage somehow, but once I entered the workforce, I realized how sheltered I had been as a student. Even as a new employee, I understood the importance of initiative and proactivity. However, being shy and reserved by nature, I found it hard to step forward. My colleagues, who joined the company at the same time as me, were more outgoing and quickly bonded with seniors and supervisors. Meanwhile, I struggled to ask questions even when I didn't understand something and just followed along, unsure if I was doing things right. At that time, a senior colleague approached me and asked, how's your work going? It was Emily, a senior by three years. She was strikingly beautiful, and I became so nervous in her presence that I acted awkwardly. In front of this senior I admired, I fumbled my words while explaining the status of my work. I should have paid more attention to help you, she said. Even though it was my fault for not seeking guidance, Emily immediately offered her support. From then on, she would notice whenever I was struggling and would come to help. At company parties, when I wasn't sure where to sit, she'd invite me to join her. Other co-workers and bosses would just say, he's a quiet guy and that was about it. But Emily, without teasing, always encouraged me, saying, ask anything and it's okay to make mistakes. Emily was promoted to a supervisor at 28. Following the retirement of our department head and Michael, everyone moved up in rank. Her constant smile, friendly approach, quick thinking, and sense of responsibility made her the obvious choice for the promotion. Even as a supervisor, Emily continued to support her subordinates, including me, and was a kind and reliable presence. She never said anything to diminish our motivation. Thanks to her, I began to gain confidence and show more initiative. I even started to notice myself becoming more proactive. I was initially reserved, but gradually I developed the ability to speak up and take action, making work more enjoyable. However, five years after joining the company, Emily suddenly took a day off. She had never missed work due to illness before. I thought it was unusual, but when I asked Michael about her absence, he only said, she's feeling a bit unwell, without providing any details or knowing when she would return. She might take a break for a while, I heard from Michael, but even after a week, Emily didn't come to work, and another week passed. One day, during the morning assembly, it was announced that Emily had resigned. I thought we had built a considerable relationship as boss and subordinate. I felt she could have at least said something before leaving, and I wanted to express my gratitude for all she had done for me. After all, I owe my progress to Emily but my emails went and answered. I even tried calling her personally once, only to hear an announcement that it was turned official. I never managed to get in touch with Emily again. Three years passed, and I turned 30. I continued to enjoy my work and led a fulfilling life. During that year's holiday season, my sister, who had moved to Alaska, returned home for the first time in years, and we planned a family gathering. It had been years since I last saw my niece and nephew. For the first half of the holiday, we went sightseeing and had a barbecue in our backyard. For the second half, we decided to relax at home. But my energetic niece and nephew couldn't sit still and wanted to play. So, along with my sister's family, I decided to go to the large park near our home. Arriving at the park, my nephew excitedly pulled me toward the big slide. As the slide came into view, his excitement peaked and he let go of my hand, running ahead. As this was happening, 
I called out to the kids, let's take turns, okay. But at the bottom of the slide stairs, there was a bit of a scuffle between my nephew and a girl about kindergarten age over who would go first. Seeing this, I hurried over to my nephew. The girl's mother also hurried over, and we both apologized, saying I'm sorry to each other. Then, when I looked up, Emily, oh, Kevin, she responded. I was truly surprised. It was Emily, right there in front of me. For a moment, it felt like time had stopped. With the kids needing attention, our greetings were brief. Soon, my nephew got bored of the slide and started playing in the spin box with my niece and the girl Emily had brought. My sister and her husband kindly offered to watch the kids, allowing Emily and me to talk on a nearby bench. The girl I thought was Emily's daughter turned out to be her niece. Emily had thought my nephew was my son. We both laughed at our mutual misunderstanding, thinking the other had become a parent. Looks like we're both still single. I thought she was your daughter because she resembles you. Seeing Emily smile again after so long brought back memories. But it's good to see her doing well. After a brief pause, I naturally spoke. I left the company suddenly back then, Emily said with a hint of sadness in her smile. I wondered why she had left so abruptly. I wanted to ask the reason I never got to hear back then, but seeing Emily's sad face, I thought better of it and held back. Emily, watching her niece, seemed deep in thought. Then she revealed, actually, Olivia's mom, my sister, passed away right after giving birth to her. Emily shared her story with a sorrowful expression. Her sister, a single mother, had complications during childbirth and tragically passed away. Shocked by this news, Emily took a leave from work. Overwhelmed by shock, she couldn't bring herself to say my sister has passed away and instead took paid leave from the company. Even after her sister's funeral, the grief of losing her sister wasn't something that could easily fade away, so she took another week off, citing poor health. The loss of her close sister was devastating, and her parents were equally shattered. Worried about leaving her grieving parents, Emily decided to resign on her last day of leave. Emily's family home was far from the company. She felt she had no other choice but to resign. Hearing this for the first time, I was at a loss for words. Eventually, it was decided that Olivia would be raised by her grandparents. However, Emily was determined to take her sister's place. After discussions, they agreed to raise Olivia together as a family of three. To make child rearing easier, they moved from the city to this more rural area. Coincidentally, it was near my parents' home. As we were talking, Olivia came over and said, Emmy, shall we go home? So, you're called Emmy. I said with an involuntary smile at the adorable nickname. Emily laughed a bit shyly. Is this big brother a friend of you? Used to being called Kevin by my niece and nephew, I felt a bit shy being called big brother. Yes, I'm a friend of Emmy. Emily seemed a bit embarrassed as I used her nickname. Thanks to Olivia, the mood lightened, softening the earlier sadness. This inbox was fun. See you again. Bye bye. Amy cheerfully called out to my niece and nephew, waving with a smile. Then, she started to leave, holding Emily's hand. Emily, can I ask for your contact information? Not wanting to part ways just yet, I hastily called out to Emily. It turned out to be the right decision to ask for her contact at that moment. Although Emily's number was still in my phone, she had changed her phone number. If I had just thought to send an email later, I might never have met Emily again. Emily gladly gave me her contact information. See you later. I said, waving to Olivia as our reunion for the day came to an end. Even though I exchanged contacts with Emily, I struggled with what to write. Glad to have met you today seemed too straightforward, and it was fun playing together didn't quite fit. 
I could easily write business emails, but finding the right words for this was tough. I kept looking at and turning away from my phone. Noticing this, my sister teasingly asked, is it about that former boss you met today? No, it's not. I protested, but apparently, it was written all over my face. She chuckled and teased. I thought she was your type. My sister knew me well. She could see right through me. Emily was indeed beautiful. Of course, I didn't think I was her match, but the Emily I saw again after three years had changed from being stern to a softer, kinder presence. On the last day of the holiday, I went to the airport to see off my sister's family. I also planned to return to my own home on the same day. Eventually, I sent Emily an email that day. Despite my deliberation, it ended up being a simple message about heading back home and that I would contact her again. Emily replied, Thanks for playing with Olivia. Take care on your way home. Back to my regular life, Emily stayed on my mind. I wanted to send her a message, but still couldn't decide what to say. Finally, I started talking about local topics, like whether the old candy store we used to visit was still there or recommending good restaurants. Emily shared her favorite spots and places she frequently visited. Sometimes we talked about Olivia, and though we didn't have deep conversations, we exchanged emails once or twice a week. Then came Christmas holiday. I hadn't always gone back home for the Christmas holiday every year, but this time, I returned on the first day of the holiday season. Though it might seem disrespectful to the ancestors, my real reason for going home was the desire to see Emily and Olivia. Hi, Kev. Olivia ran over with a bright smile. That evening, I had arranged to meet Emily and Olivia near a convenience store close to my home. Olivia had expressed a wish to go to the Christmas market with me, so the three of us set off together. Hold hands because it's crowded. Emily must have always told her that. Olivia held both Emily's and my hand tightly. It was only my second time meeting Olivia, but she was incredibly friendly and adorable. Skipping between Emily and me, she excitedly said, I'm so looking forward to the Christmas market the market I used to go every year as a child. Seeing the stalls, I too got excited, nostalgic. Christmas tree ornaments, eggnog, toy lotteries. Every time Olivia said, I want to drink this, or I want to try that, I joined in and had fun with her. When I offered to pay for both Olivia's and Emily's treats, Emily tried to refuse, but I insisted, it's okay, I love the Christmas market giving a somewhat awkward reason. I was just happy to have this reunion after such a long time and wanted to do at least this much. Seeing Olivia and Emily smiling the whole time was more than enough for me. That night, before going to sleep, I received an email from Emily. In the email, she shared how Olivia kept talking about all the fun and happy moments of the day until she fell asleep smiling and saying she wanted to play again with me. The next day, I received an email with a drawing Olivia made with crayons. It was a colorful depiction of the market stalls and the three of us holding hands, walking together. At that moment, I felt as if I had gained another niece, cherishing the drawing with an uncle's affection. But perhaps, I was already developing a different kind of feeling for Emily. As next Christmas approached, I found myself thinking about a present for Olivia, but also about Emily. Then came Christmas. Since I was off work, I went to visit Emily and Olivia. I skipped visiting my family home and headed straight to our meeting spot near the local train station. We had arranged to meet there to enjoy the Christmas event happening in front of the station. It was another of Olivia's requests that we were fulfilling. When Olivia saw me, she ran over with a smile, calling Kev, and excitedly led me to Emily. It was my first time seeing Emily and Olivia since last Christmas holiday. Seeing their beaming faces, Emily with a white scarf and Olivia's energetic demeanor, I felt a sense of relief. Merry Christmas, Olivia, I greeted, 
handing her the Christmas present I brought. Olivia's eyes sparkled as she received it, saying thank you, with a big smile, holding it carefully with both hands. Emily said to Olivia, good for you, and then turned to me with a smile, saying, thank you. She appeared slightly apologetic, scrunching up her face a bit. In fact, Emily knew what was inside Olivia's present. I had struggled with what to get her and had secretly asked Emily what Olivia might like. Initially, Emily was hesitant to tell me, but during our conversation over email, Olivia expressed a desire to go to the Christmas event at the station. Hearing about the event, perhaps recalling our time at the Christmas market, Olivia said, I want to play with Kevin again. This gave me a good pretext to meet and also made the arrangement of her present go smoothly. The dazzling Christmas lights were enchanting. I took a photo of Emily and Olivia in front of a large Christmas tree. They really look like a beautiful mother-daughter pair, I thought. Would you like us to take a picture? We were approached by a young couple, probably college students, offering to take our photo. Say that again. We can take a family photo for you, so why don't you join in? Emily and I exchanged a puzzled look. Emily appeared just as perplexed as I was. Then Olivia, smiling, beckoned us over. I awkwardly crouched next to Olivia. Along with Olivia, Emily and I also said cheese and had the photo taken. After expressing our thanks to the couple, we looked at the photo they took for us. Show me, Olivia said, and as I showed her the photo, my eyes met Emily's. She smiled at me. I wondered if her slight bashfulness was just my imagination. Was I imagining her bashfulness? The photo of the three of us, in this time spent together, filled me with happiness and warmth, and then I decided it was time to share something important with her. After dinner at a casual restaurant, I drove Emily and a sleepy Olivia back to their home. Olivia had fallen asleep in Emily's arms, exhausted from the excitement. When we arrived at the house, Emily quietly came out from the entrance. She mentioned that her mother had noticed and had taken over putting Olivia to bed. We sat on a bench in a small park across from Emily's house, and I took a moment to gather my thoughts. I pulled a small package from my bag and handed it to Emily as her Christmas present. For me, she exclaimed in surprise and delight. Can I open it? She asked. As I said yes, Emily carefully opened the small package. It's beautiful, she said. The present was a necklace with a small diamond, a gift for Emily. It was a simple design, but I had carefully chosen it, thinking it would suit Emily. She looked at the necklace with delight, but her expression also carried a hint of confusion. Emily, I know you are doing your best as Olivia's mom, but can I be by her side too? I asked her, expressing my feelings that I had been contemplating for a long time. Emily looked at me with surprise, then with a serious gaze, her eyes gradually filling with tears. She looked down, biting her lip and gazing off into the distance, seemingly lost in thought. From her profile, she appeared to be deep in thought. After a while, she spoke. I'm sorry and thank you. I'm really happy to know how you feel, Kevin. To be honest, I'm drawn to you too. You've been kind to both Olivia and me, and our email exchanges have been a comforting part of my day. I've been grateful to have you in our lives, but I want to raise Olivia properly. I may not be her real mother, but I intend to be by her side as if I were. So, I can't reciprocate your feelings. I'm sorry, but thank you. Emily tried to end a conversation there, but I wasn't speaking out of a half-hearted sentiment. I believed I understood how much Emily cherished Olivia from our regular email exchanges, even though we had only reunited less than a year ago. I knew that even if marriage was in our future, becoming a parent to someone requires a significant commitment. Regardless of whether Emily, Olivia, and I would have that kind of relationship in the future, my desire to support their happiness was genuine. I conveyed my feelings straightforwardly to Emily. Even if it's not as a lover, I still want to be there for you and Olivia. 
I might be younger and less reliable, but I want to be on your side. That's all. After I spoke, Emily, with tears streaming down her face, nodded and said, thank you. After that, we had dinner at a diner and became close enough to meet several times a year, the three of us, Emily, Olivia, and myself. After that, we continued to meet several times a year, with me visiting Emily and Olivia more often. Amy's wish to ride planes led to them visiting my area for sightseeing. When Olivia was about to start elementary school, we went shopping together for her backpack. We bought some light meals from a store and decided to have lunch in a park with a playground. While eating sandwiches and enjoying the moment, Olivia suddenly said, Kevin Emmy, are you not going to get married? By this time, Olivia had totally been used to call me Kev. I wonder where she picked that idea up from. Surprised by her sudden question, Emily and I both choked on our food. Why do you think that, Olivia? I asked, trying to stay calm. Because Kev, you like Emmy, right? Olivia, with her cheeks full of sandwich, giggled and looked at Emily and me, saying I knew it. At that moment, we both laughed along with her, but I noticed a slight change in Emily's feelings. My own feelings had also grown stronger since that time. On another day, I formally proposed to Emily. Yes, she replied, with a beaming smile and no hesitation. Thanks to Amy's words, we were able to move forward. I like to think that she was the little link that brought us together. Olivia entered elementary school, and I became her father. To be closer to our families, I made a significant decision to change jobs and move back to my hometown. We rented an apartment near both our parents' homes and started living together as a family. Now, we are raising Olivia together with both sets of grandparents. I'm committed to protecting her pure and honest smile, as well as Emily's, for years to come. Low-educated individuals, please leave now. I could no longer hold back after hearing those words. I chose to enter the workforce right after high school, but Chasen, my manager, who graduated from Oxford University, seems to hold that against me. Even at a welcome party, he relentlessly mocked me. Finally, he said, people with low education, please leave my sight. When I decided to leave as he wished, others began saying, yeah, I should go too, me as well, and one by one. Everyone started preparing to leave, and indeed, everyone left the place. Jason, left behind, probably never imagined he would end up apologizing to me. My name is Ethan. I work as a programmer at an ID company. I turn my longtime hobby into my career, and I love my work. Programming is a deeply fascinating and rewarding field. When I'm engrossed in my work, I forget about eating and sleeping. That's how passionate I am about this job. Ever since I was young, I've been interested in electronics, disassembling things like alarm clocks and vacuum cleaners, and of course, I always reassembled them. But when I dismantled my father's cell phone, I really got into trouble. Though I fixed it, I was still barred from having snacks as punishment. I remember how challenging that was for me as a second grader. It was really tough. When I was in third grade, my teacher, Ms. Anderson, said, Soon, you'll have a class on programming, so we'll give you a brief introduction to what programming is. That lesson completely captivated me, and I plunged deep into the world of programming. It felt like falling into a programming rabbit hole. Even though we only covered the basics in class, I went home and eagerly shared with my parents. Today, I learned about programming from my teacher. My father, also a programmer, said, if you enjoy it that much, I can teach you more about programming. I hugged him and eagerly asked, really, please do. I received my own computer and learned more about programming from my father, diving even deeper into this world. While my friends were obsessed with video games, I discovered I could create my own games for programming. And that's precisely what I started doing. 
The games I created with my father's help were a hit among my friends, who exclaimed, Ethan, you made this incredible. It's so much fun. I felt an immense sense of accomplishment when my programs worked as intended. Of course, my dream in the elementary school year book was to become a programmer. Throughout middle school, I remained obsessed with programming. And when it was time to choose a career path in ninth grade, I declared, I aspire to work as a programmer immediately after middle school. Naturally, my teacher, Ms. Thompson, immediately objected, advising, no, at least finish high school first. My parents also counseled, we understand your passion for programming, Ethan, but at least complete high school. But I remained determined, my eyes alight with ambition, as I asserted, I want to start working as a programmer as soon as possible. After about 20 persuasive conversations with Ms. Thompson and my parents, they finally said, even if you're not interested in certain subjects, they might be useful in the future. You're young, so you should broaden your knowledge beyond just programming. I still want to, I thought, considering my options. But then they proposed, if you attend a high school that allows part-time jobs, we'll let you work as a programmer at the company where I work. I instantly agreed, exclaiming, really? Then I'll go to high school. So, I ended up attending high school instead of working right after middle school. Had I refused, Miss Thompson was prepared to involve the principal and vice principal. So, I enrolled in a high school that allowed part-time work and immediately started my job. Of course, my workplace was my father's company. After being nurtured there for three years, I successfully secured a position at the same company. Upon graduating from high school, I transitioned from a part-time employee to a full-time employee, fulfilling my dream of working as a programmer. As a full-time employee, everyone at the company where I had interned admired me. I'm currently working on a major company's system construction, which has required me to be on a long-term assignment in the countryside, but I'm planning to return to the headquarters soon. And now, after the long-term assignment, I'm back at the headquarters. Hey, Ethan, welcome back. I've returned. It's been quite some time. You seem to have excelled over there. I've heard positive things. I reunited with my colleagues after a considerable time and distributed souvenirs. Indeed, it had been a long time since I last saw everyone. As I reminisced about the familiar atmosphere of the office after a long time, a certain individual caught my eye. He was an older gentleman, sharply dressed in a suit. I wondered, have I met him before? Just then, Tyler, a senior colleague, informed me, uh, Ethan, you probably haven't met Jason yet. He joined a company during your assignment. He's now the manager of this department and was personally headhunted by President Smith from Oxford University. No wonder he looked unfamiliar. Well, an Oxford graduate must be quite accomplished. I approached Jason to introduce myself. Jason, I'm Ethan. I was on a long-term assignment, so please excuse my delayed introduction. Ah, you're Ethan. I've heard quite a bit about you. I'm looking forward to working together. He responded with a smile, and we shook hands. He seemed pleasant, but then he unexpectedly inquired, Ethan, you appear quite young. From which university did you graduate? Surprised by the abrupt question about my education, I candidly responded, I joined this company straight out of high school. Jason's eyes widened, what? The company hires directly from high school. He exclaimed. I was puzzled, wondering if my high school graduation was really that astonishing. Perhaps for Jason, an Oxford alumnus, it was. Assuming it was a norm among graduates, I merely smiled and remarked, well, yes, I wanted to start working early. Jason then commented, I see. You must have had to start working early due to financial constraints. What a huge misconception. It wasn't for that reason, but clarifying such a significant misunderstanding seemed daunting. So I resigned to simply saying, anyway, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you and returned to my desk. However, from that point on, Jason perceived me as merely a high school graduate. 
He assigned me menial tasks like photocopying documents, sorting trash, and managing mail, all tasks anyone could perform. He didn't involve me in any programming work. I advocated for the opportunity to engage in programming, as it was my expertise, but he dismissed it, laughing. No, you're just a high school graduate, right? I'm assigning tasks that fit your level. I was excluded from the projects I had been handling. According to Jason, it's unprofessional to have a high school graduate leading projects. I felt regret for the clients and colleagues to whom I couldn't properly transition the work. But Jason, as expected of a manager who was headhunted, was an exceptional programmer and operated at an incredibly fast pace. I thought, if only he were less competent, I might have had a chance to prove myself, but I kept these thoughts private. So, I found myself unable to challenge Jason and silently followed his commands. Some seniors tried to advocate for me to Jason, but I didn't want them to face repercussions on my behalf, so I requested their refrain. In the midst of this, Brandon, known for lifting spirits in the office, suggested, since Ethan has returned to the headquarters and we haven't yet celebrated Jason's arrival, let's have a welcome party. Consequently, a party was scheduled for the weekend. Apparently, my attendance was expected. Is that fine, Jason? If it's a welcome party for me, I'd be delighted to attend, he replied cheerfully. Jason seemed to appreciate social gatherings. Ethan, you're the guest of honor, so make sure to be there. Don't worry, I'll ensure your presence. Tyler reassured with a smile, and the day of the party arrived. This party has even been mentioned to President Smith, so let's enjoy ourselves. Dylan, the organizer, encouraged as I wrapped up my work. Then, just before the end of the day, an internal call came through to our department. It was from White Work, the company I had been responsible for before being reassigned by Jason. Switching to the call, is that you, Ethan? The employee from White Work inquired. Our computer screens have frozen, and pressing the enter button only spawns continuous pop-up windows. It seems like a bug. Um, your usual contact is, Brandon, right, but he's currently preoccupied. Looking over, I saw Brandon on the phone. Many were out of the office today, and Jason had gone out, planning to head directly to the party venue. Everyone else is busy with other issues. If this isn't fixed, we can't progress with our work. At this hour, we'll have no choice but to work overtime. Overtime is the worst. We want to leave on time. I heard through the phone. I vaguely remembered White Works being famously a white company, where everyone wanted to avoid overtime at all costs. Can someone come and fix this? If it's not fixed, we can leave. Maybe Ethan can figure it out quickly. Well, I'd have to see it first to understand. White Works wasn't far from here, and since I used to handle them, I thought of going. Then I heard Brandon saying, yes, that's the plan. Thank you very much. He was about to end his call. It looked like the call would soon be over. I'm sorry, could you wait a moment, please? I put the call on hold and approached Brandon. Then, Brandon immediately hung up the phone, and I promptly explained the situation to him saying, Brandon, about earlier. Man, seriously, I need to make two more calls right now. Um, Ethan, could I leave the handling to you? Yes, of course. Now that I had Brandon's permission, I promptly lifted the hold and said, I apologize for the wait. Brandon is unable to handle this at the moment, so I'll be right there, and headed to White Works. I was excited to be working as a programmer again after a while, even though I might get scolded. Although I couldn't program at work, doing it at home was different. It felt more like a job, and I was more motivated. It's not that I don't get motivated by miscellaneous tasks assigned by Jason, but still. The welcome party is at 7 p.m. today, so there's still some time. I'll definitely finish before then. Eventually, I successfully resolved the bug, and Whiteworks didn't have to work overtime, earning me a big round of applause from everyone. Only Ethan can do it. Let's call him Ethan the Great. Almost no overtime.
We can go home. How thankful. The exaggerated joy made me leave White Works. Looking at my watch, it's almost 7 p.m. It's about time for the welcome party to start. The venue was a bar a bit away from the office, so I messaged the organizer saying, I'll be a little late, but I'm on my way, and caught a taxi to the bar. As I got out of the taxi in front of the bar, I heard someone call Ethan from behind. Turning around, there was my father. Dad. What, you just arrived too? You're the guest of honor today. Apparently, my father, the president of our company, was also invited to the welcome party today. He loves social drinking, so he would go wherever he's invited. That's probably why he was invited today. Ah, I was dealing with some issues, so I got late. Well done. How have things been recently? Are you getting along with Jason? He's a great man. You must be learning a lot from him. Ah, uh, well, haha. Wondering what would happen if I told him that I hadn't been given proper work to to being a high school graduate. My father and I entered the bar. Hey, Ethan. Good job. You're late. You were the only one we were waiting for. Oh, President Smith too. Glad you could make it. Of course, I come immediately when it's about drinking. My father laughed and we were immediately greeted by the senior members of the department as we entered. We arrived at the bar around 7.15 p.m., and Jason was already there. Since I was late for the start of the party, I went to Jason to apologize and greet him. It was now just 7.20 p.m., only about 20 minutes since the party started. However, Jason's face was already red, clearly drunk at first glance. Jason, Thank you for your hard work. Ah, uh, the high school graduate finally arrived. Making me wait, you've got guts, he said with glaring eyes. This was, whether he had been forced to drink too much or he was simply not good with alcohol. Jason was holding a beer stein in his right hand, but could it be that he was this drunk just from beer? So you, a high school graduate, decided it was okay to make me, a college graduate, Wait, and that's why you're late. Jason was completely sloshed as he confronted me, quite a gap from his usual self. Then Jason downed his beer in one go and slammed the stein down on a table with a thud. And he glared at me sharply and said, The thing is, I didn't join this company to work with someone like you. I joined to meet Mr. Maverick. Mr. Maverick, you might not know him, being a high school graduate. But Mr. Maverick is the programmer I respect the most in this world. The beauty of his programming is unmatched. Seeing that perfectly crafted, flawless program developed by this company changed my life. Anyone would be impressed by him after seeing it. Is that so? And then Jason started drinking beer again. The gap in his fervor was astonishing. But perhaps it was time for him to stop drinking beer. As I was thinking this, Jason slammed the beer stein down on the table again. Maybe the beer stein itself was reaching its limit. That would be serious if it broke. And yet, even after joining, I still have no idea who Mr. Maverick is. And there are people like you, a high school graduate, working here. People who couldn't even go to university in the US are practically inept. Hey, bring more beer. No, Jason, you've had enough. I tried to stop him, but that seemed to irritate him even more. You, what's with that attitude for a mere high school graduate? People with low education should get out of my sight. I couldn't take it anymore after those words. All right, I understand, I'll take my leave. I've never been ashamed of being a high school graduate. I don't know what he has against high school graduates, but continuing the conversation with Jason would only result in more insults. I decided I didn't want to be in the same space as him any longer and started preparing to leave, saying excuse me, but I have to leave early. To the organizer Dylan. Then Brandon raised his voice, Jason, that's enough. Ethan may be a high school graduate, but he is one of our most competent employees. I can stay with someone who keeps insulting Ethan like that. I'm leaving too, Ethan. Let's go. And Brandon started preparing to leave. Right, I'm leaving too. Me too. And one by one, 
Our senior colleagues began preparing to leave. No, no, please stay and drink. I tried to persuade them. But they retorted, how can we drink after hearing all that about our dear junior? Right, Ethan, let's go drink somewhere else. Hey, that sounds great. I'm in too. Hey, don't leave me here. I was pulled away by Brandon as our entire department really did leave the bar. The only ones left behind were Jason and my father, the president. The next day after that dreadful drinking party, when I arrived at work, the first thing Jason did was almost prostrate himself and apologize. I'm very sorry for yesterday. I heard from President Smith. I was drunk and carried away by the alcohol. I apologize. You heard everything, didn't you? Yes. I also heard that you are Mr. James's son and that you are Mr. Maverick. I heard my father told you everything. After we left the bar yesterday, my father, left alone with Jason, told him everything about me. That I am Mr. James's son, that I had been around the company since its inception, known by all employees. From upper elementary school, I was more knowledgeable about programming than anyone in the company giving advice to employees even as a child, and that the Mr. Maverick, Jason so revered was actually me. At first he didn't believe it, but he came around when I said there was no benefit to lying here. Yes, the programmer Mr. Maverick that Jason had been talking about was me. The origin of the name comes from my real name Ethan. The perfect program that Jason had praised so much was something I had created while working part-time during high school. I was perplexed to be praised so much and to be called Mr. Maverick. So, I heard from other employees that you've been sidelining my son as a mere high school graduate, not giving him proper programming work. Jason's face went pale. That's, well, my son chose to finish high school and I even had to persuade him just to attend that. Would you have given him even less work if he was only a middle school graduate? That's not what I mean. If you judge people solely by their educational background, I'll start losing trust in you. With that, my father left Jason behind and walked out of the bar. By the way, since the organizers were too angry and left, my father ended up paying the bill with his card. Maybe I should bill Jason for ruining the party, my father said, clearly not amused. It was really just the alcohol. I was drunk, Jason said weakly. But you always look down on Ethan for being a high school graduate. Brandon raised his voice in defense. Yeah, are you going to flip-flop now that you know his father is President Smith? Or are you trying to cozy up now that you know Ethan is Mr. Maverick? Yeah. We still haven't forgiven you, and the senior has got increasingly noisy. Jason mumbled, that's not what I meant, looking flistered. As the situation became unmanageable, the phone rang loudly. When I answered the phone, I heard a voice pleading, please help me. I felt a strong sense of deja vu, but the caller wasn't from White Works from yesterday. It was a different client company. Hearing their story on the phone, I inadvertently exclaimed, what? causing everyone who had been making noise until just now to look over at me. The call was about a more significant malfunction that had occurred after a recent issue they thought had been fixed. The person in charge of it was Jason. Can you absolutely fix it by tomorrow? We can't work like this. Um, could you please explain the details of the malfunction first? They said they would send the details of the malfunction in an email which promptly arrived for Jason. We all gathered around the computer to check the mail and were shocked by the massive amount of content. This amount of malfunction by tomorrow, that's impossible. This is an unreasonable request. While everyone was outraged, the content seemed manageable, not too difficult. Maybe we can do this. I reassured Jason, it's okay, we can handle this. In response, he shouted, what are you talking about? Is this some kind of revenge on me? Don't be ridiculous. Yes, it's a lot, but the content doesn't seem too hard, I replied. When I said that, Jason revisited email. Indeed, the content doesn't seem too different from the previous bug. He muttered after reviewing email contents. Right, 
We'll be okay. We can manage it today if we all work together. I told my seniors. I really appreciate you all getting angry on my behalf. But let's prioritize our work now. Our important client is in trouble. And we shouldn't let them down any further. You're a good guy, Ethan. Right? Clients come first, not Jason. But we'll make sure to settle things later. Despite someone's threatening words, we decided to focus on the task at hand. All right, let's all work hard together, I said, raising my right hand. Then, everyone joined in, cheering O, in unison. Everyone, I'm sorry to ask, but please help out. I will distribute the printed emails detailing the bugs. Can those who can start working on it right away please begin? Yes. Almost everyone from our department, including myself, took on the task, and we managed to resolve all the malfunctions just as the date was about to change. We're done. Everyone seemed exhausted, including myself. Jason, too, was sprawled across his desk. We just managed to make the deadline. It's good that we finished. I thought it was impossible, but we did it. Of course, we could. Jason is competent, but so is everyone here, all excellent engineers and programmers. Brandon, who said that, also looked completely exhausted. Usually, he's so energetic and the mood maker of our team. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry for causing all this trouble. It's too late now. We're expecting better from Jason in the future. As everyone was too exhausted to even get up, I was called by my name, Ethan. It was Jason. Ah, uh, yes. In a rush, I lifted my head, but was told, stay as you are, that's fine. Thanks to you, we were saved today, thank you. Uh, no, I didn't do much. I'm sorry for not letting you work as a programmer before. Today, I experienced your excellence as a programmer firsthand. I truly realized you are Mr. Maverick. Ah, uh, haha. I'm genuinely sorry for treating you poorly just because you were a high school graduate. I'm planning to tell President Smith I'm ready for any punishment. What? I've upset everyone, and I can't remain as section chief after this. Perhaps I wasn't suited for this position. If everyone and President Smith agree I should resign, I will step down and start again as a regular employee. Jason's face showed a resolved expression, as if he had come to terms with something. Given how far he's willing to go, he might truly resign as a section chief. That must be Jason's way of taking responsibility. I understand. I accept your apology, Jason. I said that. Today, programming education starts as early as elementary and middle school, and there are even programming schools. So. Regardless of academic background, many talented individuals are entering the workforce. Please don't look down on such young people in the future. Ah, uh, I swear I won't do that again, Jason promised. Your skills, Jason, are truly impressive. You fixed the bugs effortlessly, and your instructions to everyone were spot on. You even provided subtle support. I believe you're still suited for a leadership role like a section chief. When I said that, Jason looked like he didn't expect such words, but finally said, Ah, thank you. A few days later, Jason really was demoted from section chief and became a regular employee like us. My father said, maybe demotion wasn't necessary. But Jason stubbornly replied, I can't accept it. So, Brandon, the mood maker of our department, became the new section chief, and we continued to work hard. As Jason became my desk neighbor, we talked more and seemed to get along better than before. Then, I asked Jason something I had always wanted to know. Jason, what was Oxford University like? Are you interested? He asked. Yes, I've always been curious but never had the chance to ask. Jason responded to me saying, All right, let me tell you about it. He has become much more amiable. Then Jason shared various details about Oxford University. It's located in the heart of Oxford, famous university with many notable alumni. The campus is incredibly vast, almost like a town in itself. There's joint research with venture companies. Many students are entrepreneurs, 
and there's a diverse international community allowing for plenty of interaction. Amazing. I'd like to visit there someday. Your eyes are sparkling. Just imagining it seems fun. Why not join a campus store designed for tourists? That sounds fun, but actually, I've been thinking about going to college lately. When I said that, Jason exclaimed, What? Ethan, you're considering college? Well, after being called a high school graduate by you, I started to think about it. Ethan, are you being sarcastic? Jason glared at me, so I replied, No, not at all. Though secretly, there was a bit of sarcasm. Until recently, I had no interest in studying. I thought it'd be nice to just do what I love and live my life. I love this job and never regretted not going to college. I even wanted to start working right after middle school. I heard from President Smith, you were really considering working right after middle school, but observing you, Jason, someone with both work expertise and cultured intelligence, I've started to slightly regret not attending college. That's why I wanted to learn about Oxford University, where you studied. I guess college graduates are different after all. Then Jason thought for a moment and asked, Ethan, have you discussed this college idea with your parents? I shook my head. No, it's still a vague idea. Ethan, you've graduated high school, so you can go to college anytime. With your skills, you might be able to attend college while working. This job can be done remotely. If you really want to go to college, I think you should go. If you're worried about balancing work and studies, I'll help you in any way I can and promise to do my utmost. It might not make up for looking down on you and hurting you. Jason continued, and I was utterly surprised. Jason, he has become such a good person. Jason, you've changed. I couldn't help but say that, and he responded with a wry smile. I'm really sorry for how I was at the beginning. But I'll do anything you ask, Mr. Maverick. Please, stop with the formalities. With Jason's encouragement, I seriously started considering pursuing college. Then, I told my parents I wanted to go to college. Now 22, I am aiming for college. I'd prefer to attend a college abroad, particularly Oxford University. I've shared my plans to balance work with study preparation and my intention to try again next year if I don't pass this year. From the kid who talked about working right after middle school, my mom started crying. I wondered why she kept bringing that up, but I suppose it's proof of how much trouble I've caused, so I couldn't say anything. Of course, I was all for it. Parents want to support their children's efforts. Keep at it until you're satisfied. Expanding your interests is good, he said. With my parents' blessing, I started preparing for the entrance exams while working. Of course, I aimed for Oxford University. Jason helped me with exam preparation teaching me a lot. He also introduced me to some of his foreign friends from college days to help me learn more. Eventually, when my seniors in the department learned that I was aiming for Oxford University, they began supporting me significantly. They even told me, focus more on your exam preparation than work, and took over some of my tasks to help me out. With everyone's support, I passed the entrance exams and finally became a university student. Having passed, I am departing for England from United States tomorrow. Thinking it was my last chance, I came to say goodbye to my seniors. I had finished all my work handovers, and all that was left was to clean around my desk. Ethan, it's going to be lonely. I've known you since you were a little kid. It feels like losing a family member. It's really sad. That little elementary school kid who used to run around is now going off to college, they said one after another, making me feel really appreciated. Ethan, we all wrote messages for you. Please take this. Jason handed me a colored paper filled with words from my seniors, and it made me tear up. I'll take this to college. I hugged the paper tightly, and then my father appeared. Ethan, four years will fly by. We'll keep your seat open. So study hard and come back, said my father, the company president. That's right. If you have a summer break or something, make sure to come back. Let's talk about programming again. If I encounter something at work I can handle, I'll call you right away, so make sure to answer. Everyone chimed in with their words. 
Lastly, Jason said, It's truly amazing that you got into college, Ethan. It's all the result of your hard work. I'll keep your seat safe here. So do your best. I couldn't help but cry at that. Feeling blessed with such good colleagues, I left the company and departed United States the next day. As a university student, I enjoyed my campus life while studying every day. Today, as I was studying in my room, I heard a notification sound ping. It was the sound of receiving an email. It was an email from my father about recent updates. It said that Jason was decided to be the section chief again. Wow, that's great. I exclaimed without thinking. Jason had really changed since then, becoming more polite and considerate to everyone. It seems like there's no trace of his old self now. I remembered my father mentioning in secret that he wanted to offer Jason the vice president position. I hurriedly sent a message to Jason. I heard you're becoming the section chief again. Congratulations. Despite the time difference, I immediately got a reply from Jason. Thank you. I'll be visiting England. So let's meet up then. Of course, let's definitely meet, I replied. The encounters and events with Jason were shocking, but they undoubtedly changed my life. After all, I am now a university student. It's something the old me could never have imagined. I believe it's because Jason himself changed that we are what we are today. If we had remained at odds, neither of us would be where we are now. Life is unpredictable. I realize that people can change in any direction depending on their thoughts and efforts. I want to continue cherishing the connections with people who have touched my life and live on with gratitude.